Back in court, why two states are suing the Little Sisters of the Poor. New allegations, a senior lawmaker and high-profile media personality joined the list of men accused of inappropriate behavior. Immigration battle. The Trump administration responds to pushback over its policies. And church in Rome. We were in four different churches during those four years. Americans finally find a new place for their parish. On EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, November 21st, 2017. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. The Little Sisters of the Poor once again head to court to defend their religious liberty. This after California and Pennsylvania filed cases that would force the Religious Sisters to pay for contraception as part of their employee health care plan. The two states are fighting to block the Trump administration's rollback of the HHS birth control mandate. Our own network, EWTN, also filed a case against the mandate. Beckett Law, which represents the Little Sisters, says the move by the states reignites an unnecessary culture war. Both states sat by and said nothing for years while secular exemptions for tens of millions more people were in effect. And they only decided to come to court and say there was a problem when somebody wanted to give a religious exemption. Um, so, yes, they're targeting religious conduct here. The Little Sisters are asking the court to ensure that they can continue their vital ministry of caring for the elderly poor without violating their faith. Back in October, the health department, under the Trump administration, issued a new rule aimed at protecting religious exemptions. CBS and PBS Fire anchor Charlie Rose, he's the latest celebrity accused of sexual harassment. That growing list now also includes the longest serving current congressman. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey reports. Good evening, Jason. Hi, Wyatt. Michigan Representative John Conyers joins that growing list of men accused of sexual misconduct. That includes Charlie Rose, Judge Roy Moore, Senator Al Franken, Harvey Weinstein, and Kevin Spacey. One woman tells me it's time for Christians to change this corrupted culture. I believe in, in the American people, and I believe that with faith, we can make this happen. Patrice Anwuka of the conservative-leaning Independent Women's Forum reflects as Charlie Rose enters thorny ground. The Washington Post reports eight women accuse Rose of lewd words or unwanted touching. The 75-year-old journalist says he thought the women shared his feelings, but now he apologizes. Mr. Speaker, and, and harassment charges now also leveled against the longest serving current congressman, Michigan Democrat John Conyers. BuzzFeed reports he settled a complaint in 2015 with a woman who says she was fired for rejecting his sexual advances. Conyers denies doing anything wrong. And Senate candidate Roy Moore faces similar sexual accusations. Republicans are scrambling to figure out what to do weeks before Alabama voters choose their next senator. I have real trouble with a guy like this serving in any public capacity or maybe serving in anything at all. But second, I have real trouble with telling the Alabama people what to do. The Constitution mm. requires that they exercise their judgment. Now, I have my own opinion on how I hope they exercise it. Patrice Anwuka says Christians need to be a light in the midst of this darkness. As a person of faith, I look at uh, as you know the Christian values and Christian, and at the the this, the root of it all, we're talking about character. But if we're not dealing with their character at the young age, then we're not going to be able to really influence the future workforce, uh, society, culture. Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi calls for an ethics investigation into Representative Conyers. The government has paid more than 17 million dollars to congressional employees in the past 20 years all to resolve claims of overtime pay disputes, workplace violations, and sexual harassment. Wyatt? $17 million is a lot of taxpayer money. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey reporting. Thanks, Jason. The Trump administration tells 60,000 Haitians living in the U.S. to pack their bags and go home. The Department of Homeland Security ends a permit program that allowed the Haitians to live and work in the U.S. after the 2010 earthquake shook the Caribbean nation. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Wyatt. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops opposes the administration's decision to end TPS, or Temporary Protected Status, for Haitian immigrants. 
Homeland Security now gives them 18 months to make preparations to go back to Haiti, but some advocates say the conditions in the impoverished country haven't improved nearly enough for thousands of Haitians to be deported. We here, we representing. Shouts to protect TPS outside the White House last month, not enough to change the minds of administration officials. The Department of Homeland Security announcing Monday evening significant steps have been taken to improve the stability and quality of life for Haitian citizens, and Haiti is able to safely receive traditional levels of returned citizens. Since 2010, almost 60,000 of those Haitian citizens have sought refuge in the U.S., after a devastating earthquake killed more than 200,000 people and destroyed homes in Haiti. They've lived here on TPS permits, and now the government says they cannot renew them. We see this as an affront to American values and completely in opposition to Catholic teaching and our tradition and history as Catholics. Gene Atkinson, the executive director of the Catholic Legal Immigration Network, says Haiti, one of the poorest countries in the world, isn't ready to take back tens of thousands of citizens. The Haitians living here are living and working with legal status. They're contributing to our society. They're contributing to our communities, to employers. This decision to take legal status away from them will tear apart families. Temporary protected status covers more than 400,000 people from nine countries ravaged by natural disasters or war, including this father of three from El Salvador. He hopes to keep his TPS status to keep the life he's built in the U.S. If you take off the status, what are we going to do? My dream is going to come to a trash. In other immigration news, a federal judge has permanently blocked President Trump's executive order to cut funding from sanctuary cities, which don't follow federal immigration law. The Department of Justice is fighting back, saying the district court exceeded its authority. And we'll White. be following that as well. White House correspondent Mark Irons reporting. Thanks, Mark. President Trump addresses major flashpoints around the world during a call with Russian President Vladimir Putin. The White House says the leaders discuss Syria, Iran, North Korea, and Ukraine. Trump's phone call with the Russian president comes a day after Putin met with Syrian President Bashar Assad. The Kremlin says it wants Assad to agree to potential peace initiatives drafted by Russia, Iran, and Turkey. The Trump administration plans to reveal new U.S. sanctions against North Korea after calling the country a state sponsor of terrorism. The president wants to put additional pressure on North Korea to give up its nuclear program. So far, North Korea has shown no interest in reaching a deal. Celebrations in Zimbabwe as President Robert Mugabe resigns after 37 years in power. Mugabe's stepping down comes as Parliament was in the middle of impeachment proceedings against the 93-year-old ruler, and protesters had taken to the streets to say they wanted a change. Recently fired Vice President Emerson Managawa is expected to be named president in the next few days. Mugabe was the world's oldest head of state. A suicide bombing in Iraq kills at least 32 people in a town contested by Kurds and the Iraqi government. The explosion in Tuz Kermatu also wounded at least 80 people. No one immediately claimed responsibility. The town south of Kirkuk has witnessed escalating violence since the Kurdish region voted for independence. This week, Catholics around the world are highlighting the plight of the poor and how the church can help. In Kazakhstan, Catholics are maintaining nearly two dozen health care centers and they're open to people of all faiths. A Vatican News Agency reports the health centers are small and basic. They exist primarily to serve the poor. As one friar says, the contact with the poor is, quote, our daily bread. Pope Francis sends a video message to the people of Bangladesh ahead of his upcoming trip. Desidero inviare una parola di saluto e di amicizia a tutto il suo popolo. Pope Francis says he can't wait to meet with the people of Bangladesh, including Catholics and religious leaders from other faiths. He says this is an important time for believers to promote mutual respect and support one another. The Pope leaves Sunday for his week-long trip, during which he'll visit both Bangladesh and Myanmar. Religious leaders in Australia are coming together as well, but for a much different reason. Earlier this week, citizens in the land down under voted in support of redefining marriage to include same-sex couples. It might become law by early next month, sparking church officials to worry about religious freedom protections. Joining us now via Skype from Sydney, Australia, is Monica Dumet, spokeswoman for the Coalition for Marriage, an Australian lobby group advocating to define marriage as being between a man and a woman. 
So, Monica, your country's Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, is pushing for same-sex marriage. He wants legislation basically rushed through by December 7th, the last day Parliament works this year. What are groups in Australia like yours who are pro-marriage doing to try and stop this? Well, look, we had a survey last week and the result came with a definitive yes. And so we know that we're going to get same-sex marriage in this country. What we really want to do is ensure that any law that goes through protects religious freedom and freedom of speech. So do you think you'll be successful at stopping the legislation? What do you think are the chances? Well, I, I don't think we'll be successful at stopping the legislation. We think that will go through. But now it's all about what that legislation looks like and whether or not it contains sufficient protection for people of faith, for parents who don't want their kids educated in a way that, that normalizes same-sex marriage or same-sex sexual activity. It's interesting because Australia's Catholic bishops released a statement saying, quote, any change to marriage law must include protections for religious freedom. That's interesting because we don't necessarily think of marriage law connected to religious freedom. How do the two relate? And, and do you think Parliament is considering any provisions to protect religious freedom? Well, it's at the moment, the only religious freedom that Parliament is looking to protect is that priests won't have to celebrate same-sex weddings. But just two years ago, we had the Catholic bishops taken to an anti-discrimination tribunal simply for putting out a pastoral letter on the Catholic teaching on marriage. Uh, it's about whether or not Catholic schools will get to teach the Catholic tradition on marriage in the schools. It's about whether or not Catholic charities will still be able to maintain their charity status um, even if they hold to a traditional definition of marriage. So these are the type, types of protections that we're looking for. It can be pretty scary. What, what is your advice for, for Australians? Is, is the key here awareness, Monica? What, what do you think is the solution? It's awareness and also activism. Get on, get on the phone, get on the email to your local parliamentarian and let them know that you demand your freedoms, you demand your freedom of speech, you demand your freedom of religion, and that you will look very unkindly on anybody who passes a marriage law without also protecting your rights. It's so important, and obviously, to highlight the situation there in Australia, similar to the U.S., where we're fighting sort of this culture battle. Monica Dumit, spokeswoman for the Coalition for Marriage, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you for having me. An Irish Jesuit priest who saved many lives on the battlefields of World War I is the subject of a documentary set for release next April. Father Willie Doyle repeatedly went into no man's land and dragged Irish soldiers back to safety. This before he was killed by a German mortar in 1917 at the age of 44. The documentary will reportedly be filmed on location in three areas, including a battlefield in Belgium and will include readings from his diary and historical footage. It is being produced by EWTN Ireland. Coming up, new church home. Uh, this has been a, a real uh, godsend to folks who are here on business or working at the embassy to connect with other Americans. Americans in Rome find a new place to worship. And Vatican agreement, why they're sending precious art to China. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby in for Lauren Ashburn. American Catholics living in or traveling to Rome now have a new place to call home. St. Patrick's Church was formally blessed as their new parish in the Eternal City. Vatican correspondent Juliet Lindley reports. It was a day not to be missed, and U.S. Ambassador-designate to the Holy See, Callista Gingrich, and her husband Newt were among the first to arrive at the inaugural Mass at St. Patrick's. Cardinal James Harvey, one-time head of the papal household in the Vatican and a native of Wisconsin, led the celebrations along with parish priest Father Greg Aparcel and the president of the Paulist Fathers, Eric Andrews. Uh, this has been a, a real uh, godsend to folks who are here on business or working at the embassy to connect with other Americans, to feel like you're at home for a little while and have a place you can call your own. Although it's the official home for Catholic Americans in the city, the 400 families that make up the community are a great mix of nationalities. I've been a parishioner for over 20 years. Uh, my children, both of them, uh, have been baptized here. Uh, this is home for me. It's a very special occasion for me, yes. And I'm delighted that uh, they're now settled in St. Patrick's Church because I'm originally from Ireland, so I've been coming here on St. Patrick's Day for <laughs> quite a few years. and. Uh, it's wonderful that they've found such a, such a nice home. This is the Church of Santa Susanna. For 95 years, it was the home of the Catholic American community here in Rome. 
But four years ago, the nuns who owned this magnificent church insisted that because of problems with the ceiling, it had to be shut and it's never been used again. The parishioners offered to raise money to fix the ceiling, but they were told by the cloistered nuns that their money was not wanted. Thus began four years of exile, during which Father Greg had to scramble to find different locations for the everyday needs of his dynamic parish. It was a very difficult. We were in four different churches during those four years, at, uh, four on Sunday, and uh, we would travel around with our little uh, shopping cart full of uh, uh, songbooks and things like that. They appealed to the Vatican for intervention, but after a while it became clear a new church had to be found. Since the Irish Augustinian priests were leaving their ministry in Rome, St. Patrick's, just across the road from the American Embassy, was pinpointed as the best place to start afresh. And so today, more than ever, parishioners celebrate living proof that the church is the people, not just the building. In Rome, Juliet Lindley for EWTN News Nightly. And from an American presence in Rome to an Italian one in Russia. This past summer, the remains of St. Nicholas of Bari left Italy for the first time and spent two months in Russia. There, two million people venerated the relics. Some in the church wonder if the move is a sign of a thaw between Orthodox and Catholic churches, separated since the 11th century. But a full unification between both sides doesn't look like it's in the cards. A recent study by Pew Research found only 35% of Eastern Orthodox followers in Europe want to reunify with Catholics. Those 7 in 10 say they like the progress Pope Francis is making in the relations. For more analysis, we're joined now by Dr. Matthew Bunsen, an EWTN senior contributor. So, Matthew, why are Orthodox Christians seeming lukewarm on the reconciliation here? Yeah, well, the number that you cited, 35%, is even worse in the Russian Patriarchate of Moscow. Okay. That's 17% actually favor that. Now, that's significant because there are 100 million of the 260 million Orthodox in the world belong to that Patriarchate. So, almost 40% are even lower than that. If we're looking for why, we have to look at theological, historical, and cultural reasons. Theologically, there are a lot of disputes that historically have been present in that relationship. We can look at the filioque, for example, the procession of the Holy Spirit, that was a, a controversy, as well as the big sticking point, which is papal primacy. Historically, you have a very long memory among the Orthodox for events like 1204 and the Fourth Crusade with the sacking of Constantinople mm -hmm. and the failure of reunion in 1274 and 1439. Sure, there are so many factors here. You also mentioned geography as one, you mentioned Russia, for example. How does geography play into this? Because I'm guessing if you're closer like, to other parts of Europe, like Ukraine, they'll be a little more friendlier. Right. The fundamental reality is that 77% of the Orthodox in the world live in Central or Eastern Europe. Okay. That makes sense, again, historically, because the Orthodox faith spread so rapidly among the Slavic peoples and, of course, was an instrument of evangelization across the whole of Russia. The problem with that, then, is that you have a geographical isolation of the Russian Orthodox as well as the rest of the Orthodox communities, the autocephalous churches, as they're called. The Orthodox also, unlike the Protestants and Catholics, uh, did not embark upon a massive missionary endeavor uh, that we saw in the 17th, 18th, and, of course, into the 20th century. Sure. Like I said, so much history there. Is there any reason, though, even with that 35% that you saw, is there any reason to feel optimistic that there is reconciliation talks between Orthodox and Catholics? Yeah, very much so. Well, we have seen progress under the popes in recent decades from Paul VI forward, and especially under Pope Francis. Pope Francis met in, in February of 2016 with Patriarch Kirill of Moscow. That has opened the door for even more discussions between the Church and Russia. I point out especially the recent visit of Cardinal Pietro Parolin, the Vatican Secretary of State, to Vladimir Putin, opening again more dialogue. So both sides, the leadership of both groups, I think especially of ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew, they want to have continuing dialogue, and Pope Francis is leading that charge. And I don't think it's something we can take for granted because that relationship between the leaders has gotten so good even with past, I mean, within this past decade, I should say. Matthew Bunsen, EWTN senior contributor, thanks so much for your analysis. Great to be with you. The Vatican agrees to a cultural exchange with China. The Vatican museums and Chinese museums will each swap 40 works of art ranging from paintings to ceramics. I think a lot of times uh, cultural exchanges can be a lot easier <laughs> than uh, strict diplomatic exchanges. And, uh, and that's what's happening here. It's a very positive uh, story for both sides. A Chinese spokesperson agrees, saying he hopes the exchanges will build mutual trust. Pope Francis and Pope Benedict XVI have both made normalizing relations with China a priority, but the Vatican and China remain at odds over several key issues, including the Pope's authority to name bishops. 
Up next, White House holidays from today's turkey pardon. You are hereby pardoned. To the official Christmas tree, how the first family is keeping a focus on faith. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby in for Lauren Ashburn. Christmas season is almost here with lots of pictures and video of presents, pageants, and parties. But photos won't help everyone remember. More than 5 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease. And a recent poll finds many in this country are uninformed about how vulnerable they might be. For a closer look at the study, we're joined by Katherine Hayes, Director of Health Policy at the Bipartisan Policy Center. That's a think tank based in Washington, D.C. Catherine, welcome to the program. Let's take a look at some of the key findings in the poll that we discovered here. Only 22 percent of Americans know that Alzheimer's disproportionately affects women, women in particular. What do women need to know about the disease? Well, first of all, they need to know that just because you don't have a family of, of a family history of Alzheimer's doesn't mean that you're not at risk for it. And many women not only end up being victims of Alzheimer's themselves, but they are also the primary caregivers for friends and family members who are often um, afflicted with Alzheimer's. And caregiving can be a big challenge for, for a lot of those families, especially when you think about the cost of health care. Um, it was interesting reading about the cost of health care because back in 2014, the average annual cost to living in a nursing facility, for example, is about $90,000. I can only imagine how much that's gone up within the last three years. How can we better prepare financially when the costs just keep going up? There are a number of things that you can do. One is if you're still younger, if younger, if you're my age, for example, um, you can look into buying private long-term care insurance, and that will help offset some of the cost. You can also think about your retirement savings, both in terms of paying for food and lodging, but also in terms of paying for your long-term care. Sure. Uh November is also, interestingly enough, National Caregiving Month, so families will be obviously getting together for the holiday season, and, and you guys often encourage them to talk about the long-term health care needs when it comes to caregiving for family members and stuff like that. Tell me a little bit about what families should talk about specifically when they think about their future needs. Sure. You know, this is going to be a difficult issue because it involves family finances, but really what you need to ask your parent or loved one is who they really want to take care of them if they need help with things like bathing or dressing or managing medications at some point in the future in order to remain independent at home. It, it's so important. Uh, why is that so important just to plan that out when you think about the years ahead? Well, all too often it hits the family when a mom or dad is being discharged from a hospital and no one really knows what to do. They know that the parent can't stay home alone but they haven't made plans as to who will step in in the short term and figure out exactly what kind of care they need. Sure, it's so important, like I said, just to be able to plan and talk about it even among family members and loved ones. And we're happy to highlight National Caregiving Month as well. Catherine Hayes, Director of Health Policy for the Bipartisan Policy Center, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you. Christmas comes early this year to the White House. The official White House Christmas tree arrived in grand fashion. The First Lady and son Baron Trump received it from the Chapman family, the owners of Silent Night Evergreens in Wisconsin. The Chapmans agree with President Trump, who says even if it's not politically correct, he's going to say Merry Christmas. He wants to, you know, bring back more of the traditional sense of the, the holiday and that it's not, you know, it is a Christmas tree and it is, you know, Christ's birthday and I guess to call it a holiday tree, I mean, it's still a beautiful tradition, but I, I like the idea of calling it a Christmas tree. Yes. Since 1966, the winners of the National Christmas Tree Association contest have provided the official White House tree. This is the third time the Chapman family have won the contest. And finally tonight, with the holiday spirit in mind, President Trump grants two pardons, sparing two turkeys in a long-standing Thanksgiving tradition. It was 70 years ago that the National Turkey Federation first presented the National Thanksgiving Turkey to President Harry Truman, who, I might add, did not grant the pardon. He refused. He was a tough cookie. The president spares 47-pound drumstick and 36-pound wishbone. This in a lighthearted ceremony in the Rose Garden. The president and his family later left for Mar-a-Lago for the holiday. The turkeys are headed to a retirement at a Virginia estate. We should all be so lucky to be able to retire at a Virginia estate.
Well, that wraps up our newscast for the night. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We'll be back tomorrow with one last newscast before our Thanksgiving break. We'll see you then. Good night and God bless.